Okay, so my talk is going to be very different than everybody else's so far. Um, I took the e email, uh, I guess I interpreted one sentence in a very particular fashion that said, describe your research and your interests. So this talk is going to be more like, hey, this is the kind of the stuff that I do and the kind of the stuff that I'm interested in. Um, so it's not going to go into depth at all uh, into any of my research. It'll just basically be like five, three minute selling point <laughs> kind of thing. So if you're interested in anything uh, that I have to say, then we have two more weeks to talk about it. Um, otherwise, there's a lot of a lot of stuff here. I don't expect you to understand it all. Just sort of let it wash over you. And if there are any pretty pictures that you think are interesting, I'll be happy to expand on it further. Um, so how's the color on this? Not too bad. OK, so basically, um, I'm splitting this up by the math areas and the rough sort of bio applications that correspond to these. Um, so we're going to start in the beginning. Kind of this also goes chronologically. Uh, I, I started out as a mathematician studying symbolic dynamics, applied it to genomics, and then we'll continue onward. Um, so brief two or three slide example of what symbolic dynamics is. It's basically just studying uh, the evolution of a map applied to a space that goes to itself. So you think about a function, a function applies to something, and then you just keep on iterating that guy. And I was uh, looking at symbolic systems in the ship map. So here's a very suggestive string of symbols. And then you just periodically drop off the first symbol and keep repeating that. And you take your favorite function and apply it to it and study the mathematical properties of these things or certain functions. So the whole general idea is basically you have a long string of symbols like this. And you slide one of those functions up along this guy, very particular math functions, and they change like this. And that will let you be able to like classify the individual bits of the sequence. So the couple of functions that I was interested in were entropy, which is basically like complexity of a sequence, as well as something called topological pressure, which is sort of like weighted importance of subwords in a sequence. Um, so here's a formula. Don't try to understand it, but basically it's just the proper way to count over subwords when you want to weight these guys in very certain fashions. And since you're allowed to weight importance of different subwords, you can actually train this thing. So for instance, if we wanted to try to get this function to track with a coding sequence density along a genome, you could do that. So for instance, we trained it um, to train the importance of subwords on the human genome, looked at comparing this to the rhesus, and tried to compare that to other gene finding techniques like gene ID, and you get a picture that looks like this. So this is uh, a windowed chromosome of rhesus. The black over here is the actual coding sequence density as we move along the genome. And you can see that this uh, topological pressure, which is the red, tracks the black a little bit better than gene ID tracks the black. So hey, it kind of works. Um, you can also use a bunch of math to come up with a uh, measure or, of coding sequence probability, and that'll help you figure out like what's an intron, what's an exon, with really high fidelity. Um, but that's older stuff that I've done. Um, other tools and techniques, no time to talk about, but I'm interested in because you know, you're supposed to say what you're interested in. So, Markov chains, probability, MCMC, HMMs, uh, maximum entry models, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, but anyways. We can go on to the second part, which is going to be more the meat. It's metagenomics and compressive sensing applied to metagenomics. Okay, so first off, metagenomics. Relatively recent or developing field. Uh, metagenomics is the study of bacterial communities through their sample DNA. And it's actually really relevant. On my RSS feed, I just got popped up today. A Nature article got published about them finding a very particular kind of bacteria in 10% of human doses that turns out to produce this certain chemical that is an antibiotic for uh, MRSA, so the methylacin-resistant Staph aureus, which is kind of really cool. They're discovering all these new antibiotics from places like your nose. And the way they do that is through metagenomics. So studying communities of bacteria are really important. Bacteria is everywhere. You have more bacterial cells than human cells, all those kind of fun things. There are basically two ways to study this. One is with marker genes. I'm going to concentrate on 16S rRNA, a very particular gene that is shared amongst most or all bacteria that we know of. And you basically use amplicon sequencing to do this. So the whole sort of paradigm of metagenomics is you take an environmental sample, you get a whole bunch of DNA from the organisms in there, and you try to answer questions like, Wow, the resolution on this is terrible. But who is in there, and at what relative abundance, and what things are those bacteria doing? So those are the basic questions in metagenomics. 
Christoph, let's concentrate. How do they do this? How do they go from the sample to the short reads? Well, Amplicon sequencing is one. You take your environmental sample, you throw it on a pyro sequencer, and you have a whole bunch of these bacterial genomes floating around. However, we're going to do Amplicon sequencing, so we're going to take a very specific primer to focus on one specific part. This is definitely not a bacterial genome, but hey, it's a cartoon. Um, this primer is going to attach onto a very specific part of this, the 16S rRNA. And the reason why you do that is because over here, this part is referred to as a hypervariable region. And so it mutates uh, at a higher rate. And so it kind of acts like a fingerprint for identifying the identity of organisms. And so from that, you end up with a whole bunch of reads, where these over here are your uh, primers. And then this is like the part of the sequence that will differentiate what the bacteria are. And then we're all familiar with the whole genome shotgun approach. This is when people talk about metagenomics or a metagenome, this is what they're referring to. So a metagenome is when you have all those, ooh, the, there we go, bacterial uh, genomes floating around. You shred all of them, and then you get your big bunch of samples or bunch of reads. The reason why you want to do this is because the previous one could only answer presence, absence of organisms in relative abundance. Here, you can talk about function, what genes are present, what metabolic pathways are there, you can talk about metatranscriptomics, et cetera. <clears throat> Okay, so now all of a sudden big change in gears because I wanted to describe a little bit of the math that I use to approach answering problems in the field of metagenomics. And one way that I do that is through this uh, technique called compressive sensing. So linear algebra, remember way back when undergrad days or whatever, I don't know how much people use linear algebra now um, or here. Matrix equation AX equals Y, A is a matrix, X is a vector, Y is a vector. Well, the particular matrices and vectors that I'm going to be looking at are underdetermined. So let's say that your matrix looks like this. So you have very many more columns than you do rows. It's a short, fat guy. Then if you want to solve your matrix equation AX equals Y, X is what you're trying to solve for. Y is basically your sample right here. And so using this many constraints, you want to solve for that many variables. That's terribly underdetermined. There's infinitely many solutions. You can't solve that. However, Along comes compressive sensing, which says that if you make one slight little assumption that says that x has a lot of zeros, then this problem actually becomes tractable. So you can solve the equation ax equals y via convex optimization by looking for the sparsest solution, or the solution x with the most zeros, that still satisfies ax equals y. Um, and this is very cool because you can reconstruct sparse signals from very few and even random measurements, which is kind of nice. So what in the world does this have to do with metagenomics? Because that's what I was just talking about, right? Well, let's make the connection right here. AX equals Y. Basically, you can think about A as information that is contained in your database or reference database of bacterial genomes. X, that's the thing we're trying to figure out. That's the concentration of bacteria. And it's sparse, because if you have this huge reference database and you take a sample, you expect that only a small fraction of actual organisms are going to be present in that sample. So reasonable assumption. And why we're going to get that from our actual metagenomic sample, so the reads. And the way that we do this is using a KMER approach. And I call it quicker because it's quadratic iterative KMER-based reconstruction. And it's also ridiculously fast. It took me too long to come up with that name. But anyways, the way that I do that is I index the rows of this matrix with KMERs. The columns um, are indexed by known bacterial genomes. And the particular entries are the frequency of those guys in these guys. So frequency of KMERs and genomes. And this is going to be the relative abundances of these known bacterial organisms. And this is going to be the KMER counts in my sample. No time to show you results about this, but it works. And in instances where your community is uh, very well studied, for instance, like human associated, so i.e. you're not missing any columns here, it does a really good job. <clears throat> Other machine learning techniques that I use, for instance, like uh, pre-clustering the reads, you can pre-cluster these guys to attenuate noise and errors, and then combine all these guys together, or you can do like a sliding window approach and make even more columns in that matrix, et cetera, et cetera, with the whole point of wanting to decrease error, original algorithm, add on these sliding windows or the pre-clustering, and there you go. Um, Oh yeah, the one thing that I wasn't going to mention is this, this algorithm actually runs on a MacBook Air, which is really cool because how many sort of genomics, like metagenomics algorithms can run on 
such limited hardware, and that's due to the compressive sensing bit. <clears throat> However, it's only really good for higher level classifications because the k-mers that you require to use are shorter k-mers. But anyways, details, details, you can ask me about those later if you're interested. Uh, most more recently, like last month, um, paper came out that was focused more on whole genome shotgun. The previous one was 16S rRNA. This one's whole genome. This time, to be able to use very long cameras, instead of keeping track of the cameras, we just keep track of how those cameras overlap between two genomes. So now our matrix looks like this, indexed by known bacterial genomes on top and on bottom, and the entries right here are going to be the percent of cameras shared between those organisms. Um, Existential relative abundances, this is going to be the percent of the sample shared with the genome belonging to bacteria I in terms of KMERS. You look, you look for it here, correct? Y yes. Is yes, Y is given, A is basically our training data, sure. and X is what we want to reconstruct. Exactly. So any known genome? Yes. Yes, what, do, what does X give us? Yeah. X give a, gives us the presence and abundance of these organisms in our sample. So you give me a sample, after I do this, the X will tell you there's 3% of this, 40% uh, so of that. Pretty much the same, the, the message. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Except here, we can use very, very long cameras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But mm -hmm. in, in different, but again, the presence of guys, the, the bacteria in your sample. Yes. Yes, exactly. Long cameras are good because if you want to tell taxonomy apart, it's a lot easier with long cameras. So this is a heat map of one of those matrices A for K equals 40. And you can see that it's really easy to tell bacteroides away from Brucella, for instance. <clears throat> um, let's see here, 11 formats. Oh, I might have to skip of this. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of math behind it. Um, and I, I do have this video that I'm, I don't, oh, let's see here. It's been speaking for 11 minutes, four more. Ah, I'm going to show this video, even if I have to skip the rest of it, because it just came hot off the presses. This journal wanted me to make a video that summarizes it, and it summarizes it in three minutes, and so it's a lot better than I could. So let's just watch it real quick. Hi, I'm David Kozlicki, a mathematician. And it's very weird to hear me talking while people or whatever. validate metapallet, we compared it to a number of other taxonomic profiling methods 
using data published independently by different authors. This shows that Metapallet compares favorably to these other methods and is quite precise. We also analyzed a previously published Iowa prairie metagenome, and Metapallet predicted the presence of a novel strain of gray rhizobium valentinum. Using sequence alignment, we were able to extract a taxonomically informative gene from the sample, and further taxonomic analysis of this gene was in agreement with the prediction made by Metapallet. We've tried to make Metapallet as easy to use as possible by also providing a Docker container, which should allow scientists to easily run this method without needing to install a bunch of hard software. Okay, I'm going to stop it there so we don't go over time. Um, this is the advantage of having graphics design friends and videographers. I can't take any credit for any of that. Um, but anyways, yeah, so that was Metapallet. Um, if you're interested, ask me about it. Uh, if not, don't. Uh, other tools and techniques, I'm also interested in functional inference, uh, so functional annotation, as well as metagenomic assembly, as well as part of a, a consortium that is creating a framework in which you can compare the diaspora of different metagenomics tools that are out there. Very lastly, uh, last two minutes, um, other sort of techniques that I'm interested in. Uh, de Bruijn graphs, I love playing with De Bruijn graphs, they're calling the De Bruijn graph is a graph with vertices given by cameras and an edge drawn between them if the tail matches the head. And I'm going to put frequencies on top of these guys uh, demonstrated by disks. You can compare these, compare samples using this by looking at the camera counts or camera frequencies, overlay them onto De Bruijn graphs, they live in the same space, and then you want to see how similar these two are, so basically that means just take the blue, make them overlap the red, and figure out how much you had to move how far, and that gives you a metric. Um, so this allows you to cluster microbiome or metagenomic samples without a reference database. So here's a bunch of HMP data, and we uh, used five MERS in this method. Uh, this is work with Sergey, uh, and uh, I just got accepted uh, ACMBCB. Um, feel free to read the bioarchive article if you're interested. And Last thing is Unifrac. Uh, familiar with Unifrac distance? It's a way to compare distributions on phylogenetic trees. So it's very popular in metagenomics. Um, very briefly, what it is is basically if you have a sample and you have a taxonomic abundance, so there's like a third of organism three, a third of organism seven, like that, and they're all related by a taxonomic tree that looks like this. You can put these guys on the nodes of the tree. You have another sample, you put those abundances on the nodes of the tree, and then to say how far the red is from the blue, you just see how far you have to move all the mass to make one, overlap the other, keeping track of the amount of mass you moved, and how far you moved it. Hey, didn't we just talk about that? This was the earth movers distance. Um, so it turns out that you can do this in a more computationally uh, efficient fashion than people have done before. If n is the number of nodes in the tree, the fastest implementation of EMD so far is like n squared log n. Uh, with my, one of my PhD students, we are able to reduce this to an algorithm with a worst case linear performance, which is kind of cool because then you can show plots that look like this. And it's like, woohoo. Um, but the cool thing is, is that it also tells you what moved where, which will give you differentially abundant organisms and tell you, oh, in this sample, you have more of this one organism than that organism, et cetera. So I don't have time to tell you about persistent homology, which is really cool topological data analysis stuff, which lets you get super pretty pictures that look like this, which allows you to cluster De Bruijn graphs for different bacterial organisms, which actually sort of corresponds roughly with the taxonomy, which is cool stuff. So if you want to ask me about that later, feel free. Um, works in progress, ecological networks, regulatory uh, networks, yada yada. <coughs> Thank you. <clears throat>